All right, everyone. Uh, welcome to what is a lecture that is going to hopefully get everyone up to speed on ketamine, uh, so that as per uh, recent protocol changes, uh, ketamine can be added to the trucks as a medical director's option. A um, uh, lot to talk about with it, uh, but before we dove into it, uh, I wanted to signify uh, that I think um, this this lecture to me is, um, you know, a meaningful lecture because it is the first lecture that I can give in close to probably six weeks that does not involve <laughs> COVID-19 and how we treat it. And I think that's a, that's, um, a sign that we are at least more comfortable with COVID-19. Still a lot we don't know, still a lot we need to learn. Uh, but that I think the way that we are addressing it pre-hospitally and in the hospital has become a little more second nature and a little less foreign. And that uh, hopefully uh, we will just continue to do it well and do it right so that we can all stay healthy and we can get as many people healthy moving forward as possible. Uh, so thank you for all your work with all of that. And um, let's dive into uh, to ketamine. Uh, because, you know, ketamine is an interesting, uh, interesting drug. Um, ketamine is actually in a class of medicines called dissociative anesthetics. Um, it's a brother or a sister medicine to THC, uh, to PCP, uh, or even um, uh, the cough suppressant medicine. Um, oh, why is it slipping? To even to some of the cough suppressant medicines we use. Um, as far as things go, dissociative anesthetics are very interesting because their mechanism of action is very different than any anesthetic that we, you know, that, that we use in the medical field. Um, most anesthetics work by depressing the activity of brain cells and in doing so put us into a degree of sleep uh, or somnolent state such that we don't remember uh, or don't feel anything. That's what allows surgery to happen and things like that. Um, ketamine and the, and the other dissociative anesthetics are very different uh, because they at different doses have different effects. Um, and, and quite frankly, they cause their anesthetic effect through very different means than the other uh, anesthetics, and we'll get into that. I think really what I want to build into your heads initially is that when we utilize ketamine, there is a, in effect, a cutoff. At one milligram per kilogram IV, or at two to three milligrams per kilogram intramuscularly, ketamine is now an anesthetic. Below one milligram per kilogram IV, ketamine is in effect a hallucinogen and a pain medicine. But once you get to that one milligram per kilogram IV or the two to three milligrams per kilogram IM, it gets to be a dissociative anesthetic in which you will have an amnesic anesthetic effect. How we pre-hospitally utilize ketamine is really dependent upon this dosing scheme because when we use it at anesthetic or what I will always refer to as dissociative dosing, we are in effect putting people into a sedated state in which loss of airway is always possible. And so if we are utilizing ketamine above one milligram per kilogram IV or above two to three milligrams per kilogram IM, we are giving an anesthetic dose. And so we need to be very, very careful that our patients maintain an airway so that they can continue breathing. We're gonna make a distinction in a little bit that with ketamine, there is a difference between airway maintenance and breathing. And I just want you to kind of remember that as we make that distinction going forward. 
What I mean by a dissociative anesthetic is that a dissociative anesthetic, in effect, cuts the surface area of the brain that we call the cortex of the brain. It cuts the communication between that cortex and the subcortex. So that if we look at this picture here, in effect, the purple kind of yellow or the purple squiggly lines along the surface of the brain are considered the cortex. Where we look, the subcortex is all of that colored material down deeper in the brain. Basically, the subcortex takes all the signals from the neurostimuli from the rest of our body, integrates it, and then sends it up to the cortex so that the cortex can store and remember the patterns of that data. So that ultimately, memories and sensation is possible because the subcortical structures integrate it and send it to the cortex. So that you can see that if we use a dissociative anesthetic such as ketamine to stop the communication between the cortex and the subcortex, that we will have lack of memory and even impairment of sensation such that we get good pain control as well as anesthetic effect from a drug that has this effect. As far as things go, the beautiful aspect about ketamine as an anesthetic is that the cortex is not required to maintain breathing. So, when we use a dissociative anesthetic like ketamine, the subcortical structures are still stimulating the body to breathe. So that ultimately ketamine does not impair respiratory drive, does not impair how fast the body is stimulating itself to breathe. The biggest issue that I can tell you though is that ketamine can sedate the cortex enough such that muscle tone is lost and therefore airway can be lost because of gravity pushing tissues in the way um, or letting the tongue flop back. So that with ketamine, we are preserving respiratory drive, but you are not preserving airway. And so the important thing that I can tell you is that when this is being given at a dissociative dose, people will stop breathing. But they won't stop breathing because you've anesthetized them too much. They will stop breathing because they've lost airway. And you can easily fix that with a jaw thrust, an oral airway, and worse comes to worse, addition of a BVM to it. But using all equipment possible and available to you to monitor for that loss of airway is very important, and we'll talk about that. Ultimately, when we're separating and altering the communication between the cortex and the subcortex, as ketamine does, at low doses, the subdissociative doses, we are potentially altering the integration of pain and therefore minimizing the perception of pain. But we are also altering and minimizing the sensorium in general. And that is how people ultimately get the hallucinogenic effects of ketamine and why ketamine is a well-known drug of abuse because it causes altered sensorium and potentially hallucinogenic effects. Why do I run you through all of this? Well, I want you to have an understanding of how and why it works. And that's the biggest thing. We can't talk about a drug without talking about side effects.
Most times I would talk to you about side effects after we talked about therapeutic intervention. But I want to be honest that I think that when we're thinking about therapeutic intervention, we need to be highly considering the side effect profile. And what I mean by that is, um, is sometimes, especially when you look at the protocols that involve ketamine for you, there is a dealer's choice of medicines that can be used. And considering the side effect profile of all these medicines in determining the appropriate medicine to use is the most important thing. And so what I want to, to be very clear about is the main physiologic response that you will see in anybody that's administered ketamine is that ketamine promotes the release of catecholamines. What do I mean by that? Ketamine, or ketamine promotes the release of epinephrine and norepinephrine into the bloodstream. What does that mean? We're going to see increased heart rate, increased blood pressure. Because of both of those, we're going to see an increase in oxygen demand on the heart. You can get bronchodilation from it. And you can get agitation. Well, you know, it's, it's interesting because we can use this side effect at times to our advantage. I use this to my advantage all the time in patients with asthma that I'm intubating. Of course I'm going to use ketamine as a sedative to intubate them because they're going to have a catecholamine release that is going to cause bronchodilation and hopefully alleviation of their respiratory distress and respiratory effort because of that. For patients that are septic with low blood pressure that need intubated for intubation for airway protection, I'm going to use ketamine because I may get some increase in blood pressure and heart rate alone from the ketamine based upon that catecholamine release. For you guys, it's more important, I think, to realize that the catecholamine release is a potential side effect, an adverse effect of the medicine based upon the fact that you are not going to be using it for intubation, but rather for either pain control, for sedation, for electrical cardiac activities, or for, um, or for sedation of the severely agitated person, or for, um, or for uh, what's the last one, sedation of the intubated patient, or for the patients that you have ROSC from. To me, using this as a sedative for the severely agitated patient, we need to be careful as patient age increases or as their risk for coronary artery in disease increases. Because the last thing you want to be doing to a patient with known coronary artery disease is giving them a bunch of epinephrine to increase their oxygen demand of their heart and potentially cause more of a heart attack. Splitting hairs to some degree, but just something to think about. Far and wide, beyond the catecholamine release caused by, by ketamine, nausea after administration of ketamine is a very common side effect. When we use ketamine for sedation and, proce and procedures in the ER, one of the most common side effects we see as people wake up is nausea. The beauty is, is that we have medicines in our toolbox to potentially fix that. And so it's not something that I terribly worry about. From there, if we jump to the bottom of the list, anybody that is sedated with ketamine, you are going to see some rapid eye movements consistent with nystagmus that are not a sign of consciousness, but are in effect a side effect of the medicine. The other common side effect that people have is something called an emergence reaction. And that means that when people are sedated with dissociative dosing of ketamine, that they can become really agitated as the medicine wears out of their system. <laughs> 
that is something that actually we sometimes treat with Versed um, to calm, calm people down as they're waking up. We try not to do that. And I'll tell you that my last few patients that have had emergency reactions, I just generally whisper in the ear, hey man, I just gave you some special K, enjoy the ride. And they smile and sit back and relax. But just know that increased agitation as they're coming out of the ketamine is a significant known side effect. On top of that, they, even at sub-dissociative dosing, people akin to like how some people react to marijuana, um, people with sub-dissociative dosing of ketamine can become very agitated because they don't like the out-of-body out of experience that they're experiencing and become agitated and worried because of that. And that, in theory, is a similar to an emergence reaction. Usually talking people through it or considering a slight dose of Versed would be the way to treat that. From there, really, the most worrisome side effects, but far less frequent in incidence with ketamine, are laryngospasm and bronchorrhea. And what I mean by that is that, is that ketamine can cause laryngospasm, which is spasm of the vocal cords, leading the vocal cords to stay obstructing the trachea and spasm such that it can be very difficult and require increased pressure to get air through there. That can lead to people being unable to breathe on their own. When you give ketamine and notice that somebody is kind of now <clears throat> gasping for air with Strider, that it would be the number one signal of, of laryngospasm. The first treatment modality for that would be to provide BVM ventilation with the knowledge that most patients with laryngospasm, the increased positive pressure from BVM ventilation can in fact push past the vocal cords and ventilate the patient until spasm reduces. The next step would be talking about placing a supraglottic device to just increase the focus of pressure onto the vocal cords. Probably the most common um, you know, definitive treatment that I would use in the ER if I couldn't bag a patient would be to give them a dose of succinylcholine to paralyze the muscle, relax the laryngospasm, allow me to bag them, and then when the, once, the, once the succinylcholine wears off in about three to five minutes, know that I'm, you know, the patient's going to start breathing on their own again and probably be okay. Uh, you don't have that luxury in the back of the ambulance, so that's why bagging and really making sure you're focusing the pressure from that BVM on the vocal cords is going to get 99% of the patients through. And quite frankly, the fact that that works is why ketamine is being given to you guys, because if it didn't work, my guess is, is that the state wouldn't have put this on the trucks. When we talk about bronchorrhea as a side effect, bronchorrhea is an effect increased secretions in the bronchioles and in the upper airway, which you can imagine is not a desired effect when you are giving somebody a sedative that is at risk of promoting them to lose their airway in general. And so it's important to make sure that when you're especially giving dissociative doses of ketamine that you have suction available and that you consider that one way to potentially dry up their secretions if they get bad and if you have trouble ventilating them because of the secretions is to administer a very small, almost like quarter dose of, uh, of atropine, like 0.25 milligrams. That's nothing that's in your protocols and that's something that you should call for direct online medical control for, but it's just something to keep in the back of your mind as it's always a good idea to have the you know the counter responses when we get when we're get getting thrown curveballs that's all lastly i guess the last thing that i probably need to talk about based upon this list of side effects is sedation leading to the loss of airway I can't stress enough that ketamine will not usually suppress respiratory drive but it will cause loss of airway which means no ventilation and we all know why that's a bad thing.
ultimately this short list of people that I avoid ketamine in should be telling of how much or how comfortable I am in using ketamine. I will be perfectly honest, I probably use it as much, if not more, than any of my partners in the ER. Um, some of that comes from a comfort of utilizing it as for almost everything. Um, when, I, when I spent a month in Africa, hell, in Africa, they use this as an anesthetic for surgeries. You get your appendix out, half the time you have a non-rebreather on, get repeated doses of ketamine, and they make an incision and take your appendix out and then let the ketamine wear off. Um, that's not the way it's done here in the US. There's other anesthetics that is used by an actual anesthesiologist, but at least in Africa where you don't have anesthesiologists or fancy anesthesia, uh, a surgeon can sedate somebody for the 30 minutes they need to take the appendix out um, with ketamine and get them through. And know that they're providing them with pretty good analgesic effect as well. Because remember, the ketamine not only sedates, but provides analgesia because it separates the, the subcortex from the cortex of the brain. So, Really the question is, is, who do we avoid ketamine in? Well, ultimately, the only real contraindication in my mind for ketamine is a patient with a known history of very unstable, unfixed coronary artery disease. And this should be no surprise given our discussion on the last slide where we talked about how ketamine increases catecholamine release and increases oxygen demand in the heart. That if you do that to somebody that has unstable heart disease, you're potentially gonna cause them to have an MI uh, based upon the fact that you're causing increased oxygen demand when the heart is unable to supply itself its own blood to meet that increased oxygen demand. So really, those patients that are at the most risk for coronary artery disease, meaning the elderly or those with known coronary disease, are the people we want to avoid it in. Similarly, people with elevated heart, blood pressure, meaning the patient that has a blood pressure of 220 over 110, knowing that we may get a little elevated blood pressure from the ketamine, probably want to avoid it. Now, you could probably make the argument, is their blood pressure 200 over 110 because they're in pain, and giving them the ketamine may alleviate that. You can go down that route, uh, but you're always gonna risk further elevation in blood pressure, which could mean stroke or head bleed or, or worse. And so I try to avoid ketamine in patients that are severely hypertensive. From there, you know, the, the, the other person that I, avoid sedation medicine in is the patient that is severely agitated with a potential difficult airway or compromised airway. So take the, take the patient that, um, you know, that is agitated because they're hypoxic um, and uh, they're agitated because they're hypoxic because they have an upper airway obstruction or a partial upper airway obstruction. Giving them a medicine that could take away their only compensating factor to keep them partially ventilating, which is their own control over their airway, and now you lose the airway and can't alleviate the obstruction, we've in effect potentially killed this patient. And so using ketamine to sedate or even to control pain in a person agitated because of upper airway compromise or even pulmonary compromise could be a good way to make their problem worse. And so really, as I've thought about it, those are the four main groups that I would avoid ketamine in. Otherwise, um, you know, it's interesting. It's a great medicine for kids, but as you're gonna see as we look at the, few, at the further protocols, we're really not uh, okay pre-hospitally to use it in kids. Um, it's really there for use in adults and adults only, uh, which quite frankly, I have no problems with, but we have to be vetting the adults that we're giving it to and specifically avoiding it in people with known bad coronary artery disease or, as, or in the, you know, the significantly elderly populations as well or the hypertensive patients.
ultimately, like we talked about, our desired effect is going to dictate the dosing range that we give. When we're giving it for purely analgesic effects and we don't want to sedate or dissociate the, the patient, the protocol allows us to give it at a 0.3 to 0.5 milligram per kilogram dose IV over 10 minutes. This is a great anesthetic um, in this dosing range. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in the future. I want to be very honest that that dose over 10 minutes is an important distinction because with ketamine, the faster we push it, IV, the more likely we are to have immediate loss of airway control and the more likely we are to have sedation. And so especially when we're giving ketamine for a, a sub-dissociative dose, we want to make sure that we're infusing it over more than just 30 seconds to a minute to prevent overt sedation or the dissociative effects that could include loss of airway. Then again, if you've got a patient that you've put a king tube or intubated, and um, you get ROSC from their cardiac arrest, and now they're becoming increasingly agitated, trying to pull the tube, trying to fight. I think there's no better medicine in your toolbox than ketamine to sedate them. Why? Because at that one milligram per kilogram IV, push it as fast as you want because you've got control of their airway you're going to have rapid sedation of them that's going to last for potentially 15 minutes and can be redosed. We have to be a little careful, and we'll talk about this with patients we think have cardiac arrest from an MI or something like that. But there's other considerations that come in the, into the post-ROSC realm that we'll need to talk about. Similarly, the highest dosing range that we are going to use pre-hospitally is for the sedation of the agitated, delirious patient. Far and wide, as we'll look in a minute, the most rapid means you have to sedate somebody in your toolbox after this protocol gets enacted by your department is going to be ketamine. We know that Haldol or Versed, when given IM, has maximal effect in about 10 to 15 minutes when given alone. Most people that get ketamine IM at the four milligram per kilogram dose up to 400 milligrams are going to probably be sedate within five to 10 minutes. And so you can see that that's a much quicker and appropriate way to gain control of the seriously agitated patient. It's probably this utilization that is the most, <clears throat> that is the, is the reason why ketamine is going on the trucks. And once it went on trucks for this, we started using it for other things. I will say that on Cape Cod, I'm not sure it's as needed as it is elsewhere because Cape Cod has the, has the benefit of having very responsive police with tasers on their belts, um, which quite frankly may be even a safer way for everybody involved um, to get control of the seriously agitated patient. But this is just another tool in the toolbox, and that's the biggest thing that I can say. Lastly, the uh, ketamine was put into the protocols for premedication for electrical therapy. You can see that the dosing range is a little bit lower than what it is for analgesic effect. And we're going to talk about it. I'm not sure that this is the best utilization completely, but let's talk about it because I think it has some utility in certain patients, but probably less utility in others. So. To me, second to the sedation of the severely agitated patient, I think ketamine is the perfect pre-hospital drug for pain control. 
in patients that do not want opiates or in patients that get opiates but don't have adequate pain control. When you look at this whole list, my biggest frustration is where do we start? This is a dealer's choice of pain medicines. Well, many of our services still have both fentanyl and morphine. So where do we start? I'll be honest. Tell the state if you want or not. They don't want to listen to me. I'd love to see oral, Tylenol, and Motrin come off the trucks. I'd love to see Toradol come off the truck. And I'd like to see IV Tylenol, fentanyl, and ketamine. I'm split on the morphine because I think there's a lot of utility for morphine for those patients coming from the lower cape that need longer pain control than just 15 minutes from the fentanyl. But we won't get into that right now. Ultimately, when you look, there is a complete dealer's choice for all of these medicines. Let me try to simplify it for you. Ultimately, my belief is that ketamine is best for pain control in those patients that are not getting adequate pain control from Tylenol and opiates, or those patients that do not want opiates and are not getting adequate pain control from Tylenol alone. What do I mean by this? I mean, quite frankly, I'm in a place right now where based upon the synergistic effects of Tylenol and opiates, meaning if you get five or two pain point relief with Tylenol and five pain point relief with fentanyl, together, given together, they probably give you nine points, which is more effect than the sum of the two. To me, that is probably the standard therapy for pain control right now in the emergency room. And I think it's easy to let that swing into the pre-hospital realm. Because especially any of your departments that have longer than a 10 minute transport time should have no problem getting a gram of IV Tylenol in over 10 minutes. And if the pain is still severe, despite that, or even while that's infusing, giving a dose of fentanyl, an appropriate one microgram per kilogram dose of fentanyl, is probably the best means to control the pain. Really the question to me comes, what do we do if we've done that and people still are having pain? Well, I think that's the perfect time to consider either a repeat dose of fentanyl or a dose of IV ketamine to, ha to allow some of that dissociative effect to kick in and to work. It's interesting, the sedation effect of ketamine lasts about 15 minutes. The analgesic effect of ketamine, when given either at analgesic dosing or at sedative dosing, lasts an hour to two hours based upon recent studies. So that when we give a dose of 0.3 to 0.5 milligrams per kilogram of IV ketamine over 10 minutes, we're potentially giving them an hour or two of increased pain relief. And so I think utilizing it either in those patients that have had no relief of pain from IV Tylenol and IV fentanyl, or giving it to those patients that are refusing opiates either because of a past history of abuse or a family history of abuse. I think those are the perfect patients with significant injury that get an IV dose of Tylenol and get an IV dose of ketamine. And just remember that that's given slowly to prevent sedation or loss of airway and that even at the smaller doses there can be the out of body experience which some people don't tolerate well and really need to be kind of talked down from. But I think that this is a great medicine to use when opiates and Tylenol are ineffective or 
when patients are reluctant to take opiates and Tylenol alone is not controlling their pain. That would be the algorithm that I would highly tout to all of you. The last time we talked about analgesic use, you got the sense from me that I didn't think that oral analgesics in the back of the ambulance were necessary. And I still hold true on that. From there, I also said that I don't think IV Toradol is an appropriate medicine for the back of the ambulance. I still hold true to that. I think people have shown that they can use it adequately, but there have been some that haven't. And um, Toradol just has a higher side effect profile and more to think about, and it's, it's something that I would suggest avoiding if you can. So for pain control, just to reiterate, ketamine can be used at a 0.3 to 0.5 milligram per kilogram dose that's given over 10 minutes. It's something that I would suggest considering for patients that do not want opiates and that IV Tylenol alone is not controlling their pain. And it can be considered for patients that have gotten IV Tylenol and an appropriate dose of IV fentanyl, but their pain is not controlled. Next, we have the easiest, most straightforward, yet still a lot of sentences protocol that involves ketamine. And ultimately, this is for sedation for an intubated patient. For those of you that work only pre-hospitally, sedation of an intubated patient is only going to probably happen in the setting of cardiac arrest with ROSC. And you'll see that if you have a patient that's inadequately sedated and they have this nice RAS score, which quite frankly, I'd read the protocol and familiarize yourself with it. I'm not going to get into it because really my down and dirty you know, um, the way of describing it is, is that if a patient looks like they're waking up and you have either a supraglottic device or an ET tube in, if they look like they're waking up and they're in distress, they're trying to pull the tube, they're trying to fight you, they're writhing around in the bed, they need to be sedated. You could argue, uh, just take the ET tube out or just take the supraglottic device out. I'll be honest, I'm not sure that's something I want you guys getting into, the, into in the back of the ambulance. Because the ROSC patients are probably the sickest, most complicated patients that you care for to some degree. So by this protocol, if you have a patient that's becoming agitated after ROSC with an ET tube in, or with a supraglottic device in, the first step is to administer 0.5 to one microgram per kilo of fentanyl IV or IO up to 100 micrograms. This can only be done if the blood pressure is over 100 millimeters of mercury and is the first step in sedating somebody with a breathing tube in place that's becoming agitated. unless the patient's allergic to fentanyl, has a blood pressure less than 100 millimeters of mercury, or, um, you know, or I would even say, even if they have the primary source of their uh, overdose, or their, of their cardiac arrest was an overdose, fentanyl should be the first step. If fentanyl alone is not adequate in controlling the agitation, then either midazolam or ketamine should be considered. And I will tell you, I think either is a decent option. I think the one consideration that we should have is that midazolam is likely to cause, is more likely to cause further hypotension and potentially respiratory suppression. Now, 
with a breathing tube in place, you're going to fix that with the bag valve mask anyway, but it's just a consideration. To me, ketamine is a great option as well at one to two milligrams per kilogram, slowly up to 100 milligrams, mainly because as we talked about, there will be no reflux hypotension that is likely to happen. On top of that, it lasts approximately 15 minutes so that by the time you get to the ER, the ER will have an ability to further assess the agitation and mental status of the intubated patient and make a determination on what to do. And in effect, when we're looking at a post-resuscitation patient that now has ROSC, they generally fit one of two patient populations, in my opinion. They are either, they are patients that have had cardiac arrest that are either now in ROSC, pretty hypertensive because they've got a ton of epinephrine kicking around, or they're hypotensive because they're acidotic and they've just had ROSC. I will be honest, I'm fine with ketamine in either of those situations. Why? Because if they're hypertensive, even to the 200s, they're that hypertensive post-ROSC because of all the epinephrine you gave them in a resuscitative effort. And all of that epinephrine is going to wear off, and the mild amount of epinephrine and norepinephrine that may be released because of the ketamine you're going to, is going to be pissing in the bucket compared to the amount of ketamine that's laying around in the, ba in the patient system. And so I have no problem with ketamine in the, even in the hypertensive ROSC patient. Similarly, if you've got a hypotensive patient, you can argue that the added catecholamines from ketamine may help reverse that. And so, you know, to me, I like ketamine for sedation of the, of the patient with a breathing tube in place. As always with all of these protocols and all of these medicines we're talking about, direct online medical control, if advice is needed, is appropriate and, you know, is probably worth calling for if you have any questions and you have the time. So, again, based upon the protocol, first step for sedating the patient with breathing tube in place, fentanyl for pain control. If that is inadequate, the next step can be considered midazolam or ketamine. Ketamine can cause an increased delirium as it wears off, which can mean more agitation but is not a reason not to use it, in my opinion, in this case. I don't mind you giving it to somebody that's hypertensive post-ROSC because we know the majority of the patients are hypertensive. The patients, of the patients that are hypertensive, the majority of them are. So because of the epinephrine we've given them as part of the resuscitative efforts and that, quite frankly, the increased catecholamine release from the ketamine is not going to do anything on top of the inhuman amount of epinephrine we've just given them. From there, the one major consideration is that you are now, if you're giving ketamine to somebody that is intubated or has a supraglottic device in, you are now giving them a dosing of medicine that could cause them to lose their airway. So monitoring the placement and the efficacy of ventilation with that device is paramount. Quite frankly, in any patient with cardiac arrest that you take an advanced airway maneuver on, you need to have you monitoring in tidal CO2. And if you're not, we'll have a conversation. So the addition of ketamine to the mix just further Re, you know, further re-emphasizes that end tidal CO2 monitoring, pulse oximetry, EKG need to be utilized. If you have any questions on all of this, please seek me out. Almost there. Halfway through. At least halfway through the indications. Ketamine also is in the
protocol for sedation in the setting of behavioral emergencies for adults. And like I said, I think that this is the most meaningful use when you don't have a common pathway of police with taser because it's gonna provide the most rapid onset of sedation. And again, that this protocol calls for four milligrams of IM um, ketamine up to 400 milligram dose. Know that you will be you will be sedating a patient with this. This patient will be not talking to you, unconscious, potentially drooling, eyes open, roving around with that nystagmus, sometimes kind of scowling or withdrawing to pain, but otherwise not fighting you. That is the intended goal with this dosing: is they're not fighting you. The reason that this is an important consideration is that for, compared to midazolam or Haldol, this has the most rapid onset of probably around five minutes on average. Some you may see in three, some you may see in 10, but it's gonna be about a five minute average for time from administration to sedation. It's important to realize that once the sedation kicks in and you have the patient secured on your stretcher, it is paramount to immediately place the patient on the monitor, continue to monitor their airway throughout, and have the patient on your monitor, pulse ox, regular blood pressure checks, and continuous end tidal CO2 monitoring to ensure that the airway remains intact. Ultimately, giving this dose of medicine, you are consciously or procedurally sedating the patient. And remember, when all of you did your paramedic time in the ER, what a rigorous routine we went through to make sure that we were complying with standard of care surrounding conscious sedation so that if something happened, we recognized it and fixed it before it came a problem. Those are still the expectations for you when you utilize ketamine as a sedative in the setting of behavior emergency. Failure to monitor these patients after you sedate them is a violation of the standard of care. I can't reiterate that enough. Ultimately, my style point, once the patient's down, you got them on the monitor, I would physically restrain them. I would, I would restrain their legs, I would restrain their, their arms. I would make sure that as the ketamine wears off, which still could be 20 to 30 minutes, quite frankly, when given that IM dosing, but you wanna make sure that as that ketamine wears off, that they're not gonna become more agitated and more of a danger to you in the back of the ambulance prior to you get into the ER. So protect yourself in that way. This is gonna be probably the number one go-to way to put down the patient that's agitated on meth or bath salts. We're lucky we don't have a lot of that here now, but who knows? There's always meth in P-Town, but luckily everyone just seems to balance that out with GHB, so at least we don't get severely agitated people. Um, you know that us on Cape Cod could probably teach a talks lesson on GHB to the entire country, because I swear the only place that it actually is right now is P-Town. That's a whole nother commentary for another day. Uh, but let's just remember that this ketamine for sedation in the setting of severely agitated patients is going to be something that we save for the most agitated, most dangerous people that we want to be put down immediately. For the moderately agitated person that just needs a little help calming down, Versed probably works great. Haldol probably works great. We just need to remember that Versed is probably the preferred means of sedation of agitated patients with head injury. Ketamine is not going to cause severe problems in the head injured patients, but there is some 
theoretical, never clinically proven contraindication to ketamine in head injured patients. So I just want you to be aware of that. On top of that, we know Haldol is contraindicated in head injured patients based upon lowering of the seizure threshold. So I can't reiterate enough that head injured patients should probably go direct, or postictal patients should go directly to Versed as a sedative. Otherwise, the most dangerous patients should probably be sedated with ketamine. And otherwise, it's dealer's choice. And I wish I had a better convention to give you, but I would say avoiding ketamine unless there is severe life or patient threat makes the most sense because the other two choices at the sedative dosing, you will not be sedating them to the point that you need to be severely worried about loss of airway. Finally, dealer's choice for sedation and analgesia in the setting of electrical therapy. This is the adult protocol. Again, complete and utter dealer's choice. I think the type of electrical activity that we are utilizing should probably dictate what medicine we will use. I will give a disclaimer that I have never used ketamine for sedation in the setting of electrical therapy. Mainly because the majority of the patients that I am using electrical therapy on are patients that have tachyarrhythmias. And so now thinking about giving patients that have an elevated heart rate and arrhythmia more sympathetic drive, more norepi and more epi from increased release from the ketamine, we're almost being counterproductive prior to cardioverting them. And so I think that for patients requiring electrical therapy, specifically cardioversion for a tachyarrhythmia, I would preferentially use fentanyl or Versed. And I don't know if there's a better one to use. I think my knee jerk would be, if I, in, the, in the ER setting, if I had to pick one to use Versed, if I had dealer's choice, I'd use both, which you don't have. Um, or I'd just use propofol, but we know you don't have that. So I think in the setting of tachyarrhythmia, I would say Versed is probably the most appropriate, but there's nothing wrong with fentanyl either. Ultimately, theoretically, ketamine is probably a very good choice in the setting of bradyarrhythmia, specifically bradycardia and the need for pacing. Why? Well, because we can imagine that a little increased sympathetic tone from some increased epinephrine and norepinephrine may help us pick up our heart rate to begin with. Um, and so, uh, so utilizing ketamine to, uh, to help patients tolerate pacing theoretically probably makes perfect sense. Uh, I've never done it. Uh, I can't speak to the efficacy compared to fentanyl or Versed alone. Um, so, and I couldn't find any studies that looked at it. So something to consider, something that theoretically may be very helpful. Uh, I just don't have enough experience to give you meaningful advice one way or the other. Remember that at this dosing, the sub-dissociative dosing, the major side effect is gonna be that out-of-body experience. And so it's something you may have to talk people through. I wanna reiterate that of all things, yes, ketamine, like any medicine, can cause anaphylaxis. I don't think we need to talk about how to identify anaphylaxis or how to treat it. But I think the one way that ketamine administration can be most dangerous and deadly for a patient is if it causes laryngospasm. Uh, 
And so again, those patients that have strider and difficulty breathing without swelling of the lips or tongue, without vomiting or diarrhea, without hives uh, or all the other secondary signs of anaphylaxis are likely suffering laryngospasm. The most meaningful way to address this is to bag the patient to increase the pressure of air moving through the vocal cords. And most will get away along with bagging alone prior to them, um, prior to them um, you know, requiring any further treatment. If you're not getting adequate ventilation with bagging alone, placing a supraglottic device to focus the pressure on the vocal cords is a secondary option. If you were to try to intubate these patients, you would be looking purely at vocal cords closed over the trachea with no avenue to get an ET tube through. So that's why if you're going to truly fix these patients, you need to give them succinylcholine to make that laryngospasm relax and see your usual vocal cords in the trachea to, to go ahead and intubate or, for that matter, alleviate the laryngospasm, let the succinylcholine wear out of their system and their breathing again. You can't do that, so you've got to either bag them or place a supraglottic device to overcome that pressure. I hope in going through that specifically twice, it sticks home. Uh, but again, I like everyone to know what the most worrisome thing is. I'll be honest, I use ketamine probably, <laughs> well, not personally, I, I prescribe ketamine, um, you know, 100 times, or not 100 times, we'll say 10 times a month. And knock on wood, I have not seen laryngospasm. It'll probably happen tonight, but uh, that's what I get for opening my mouth. Ultimately, we can't forget the side effects. Elevation of blood pressure, heart rate, increased oxygen demand on the heart, and therefore exacerbation of coronary artery disease is the most common that we see, along with some nausea in the emergence reaction and the nystagmus. Remember, the faster you push ketamine, or, or once you get into the sedating doses, the sedation can lead to loss of airway. It doesn't suppress respiratory drive, but it can prevent breathing based upon loss of airway. And remember that if you do see increased oral secretions or increased secretions from the trachea through any sort of tube that's in place, you may want to call for medical control for an order for a dose of atropine to help dry up the bronchorrhea that it can cause. Otherwise, please bring me any further questions you have about ketamine. Utilize the, meta, you know, the EMS supervisors as resources and let me know how the experience goes. As with any new medication, it's gonna be a learning curve. And I'm worried that with medicines like ketamine, the frequency of utilization is not conducive to people getting completely comfortable with this. Uh, but we can continue to work on providing meaningful use as we move along. Thank you very much and everyone stay safe.